I was gonna do a video on for Christmas, but going by all of the comments I've gotten lately, I felt like you guys would really like this video done first. Of course, the game I was gonna cover was about six hours. Battle Network 2 is fucking 20. So it took me a bit longer, but you've all been such good boys and girls this year that Santa wanted to make sure you got what was on your list. Anyways, we're back to look at Mega Man Battle Network 2, released June 17th, 2002. Meaning there's only an eight month gap between this game and its prequel, which is both impressive and only possible because the games are more or less the same in style, structure, and gameplay. But that doesn't mean we should write off Battle Network 2 as a lazy cash grab right off the bat. We try to be fair around here, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with how much Capcom was able to accomplish in such a short time frame. For future reference, I've made the executive decision to not reintroduce the world and all of the characters in each of these videos. There are six of these goddamn things, and I'd blow my brains out if I had to tell you who Lan is half a dozen times in a row. So I'm just gonna assume you've watched the first video, or you've played a Battle Network game before. It saves us ten minutes of me repeating myself. Battle Network 2 begins on the last day of school before summer break. We join Lan Hikari and his NetNavi slash brother, MegaMan.exe, as they decide how to spend their upcoming vacation. Before they can get on with their plans, though, Lan's mom gets a look at his predictably abysmal report card and forces him to study first. Reluctantly, Lan jacks his PET into his computer and starts up the teaching program. Looks like today's lesson is... a virus-busting tutorial. You know I saved the Earth, right? Why does Lan hate school so much when it seems to primarily consist of the one thing he spends his whole day doing anyway? It's fine, I guess. We got some new stuff to cover anyway. Things here on the battle grid go mostly the same as before. Send battle chips of matching type or code to Mega Man, battle the enemies on the 6x3 grid, use the Mega Buster when your chips are depleted, after enough time has passed you can open the chip window again and send more battle chips. There are a few minor improvements to the selection process this time. A chip's code can now be seen underneath it at all times, and there's a new asterisk code that works like a wild card. It can be added to any combination of chips regardless of other factors. For example, these attack ups that increase the power of the chip selected before them. Also, the add function has been made actually useful in this entry. In Battle Network 1, the add function would forego battle chip usage for one turn in exchange for an extra five chips the next turn. This was almost entirely pointless, as it wouldn't get rid of the chips you didn't need. Only add to the list, and only for one turn. The next turn, you'd still be stuck with the chips you didn't want the first time. This could be detrimental to some fights, as you'd be stuck with, say, all melee chips with no quick way to get more ranged attack chips. Now, you can select the chips you don't want anymore and trade them in. Wait another turn and you'll have not only replacement chips, but also new chips of the same number that you traded. There are a handful more gameplay additions, but we'll cover them as we unlock them. After that lovely distraction, Lan and Mega Man head for the new town square that's been constructed on the net, chiefly because they caught wind of a rumor that tryouts are being held to become official net battlers. You know, the thing show is. It's kind of like an internet police organization. Not being a net battler didn't stop Lan from poking his nose around everywhere before, so I'm not sure why he cares so much, but that's gonna be our main focus for a while. Roaming around the newly redesigned internet, you could tell a greater emphasis is placed on the area as a whole. In the original Battle Network, you really only use the basic internet twice in the entire game. Most cyberspace exploration was limited to separate computers that held self-contained dungeons, whereas now things are more open world for a lack of a better term. The first game was more or less a linear adventure, but this story has a ton of side quests and exploration you can do for extra chips and upgrades, rather than the first game where it was mostly limited to post-game stuff. 
This of course means more virus encounters, which are now more than harmless little mini-games to grind Zenny, because Mega Man's health no longer regenerates after every fight, only when he jacks out or uses a healing item. This is a very welcome addition, because it means you have to, you know, try when you're virus busting, instead of just spamming the Mega Buster. To compensate though, you can now finally run from battles without an escape chip, which is a huge relief after the non-stop surprise attacks before that ruined the later dungeon. It isn't guaranteed to work on the first try, but that's to be expected. So, right, the city net battler exam. There are various levels of net battle licenses with increasing ranks that denote the operator's skill. This first one, the Z license, is the bare minimum, so earning it is only a matter of finding some data packs lying around the net without being deleted. Simple. As the first test wraps up, Lang gets a panicked call from Glide, Yai's net navy. The gas-powered heater in her home is malfunctioning, and Yai has passed out from the fumes in her sauna. Oh, right, she's supposed to be rich or something. She was in the previous game so little, I don't even think I mentioned that. Did I? I don't remember. We barely know this character at this point, because there was such little emphasis on Lan's friends in the first game. But still, better go look for the big mansion and make sure she doesn't, like, die or something, I guess. Dex comes along to help, but neither he or Lan can get through the fog. So we send Mega Man into the ventilation system to clear things out. The Vent System is the first main dungeon of Battle Network 2. This game continues the trend of main netscapes being based around a themed gimmick. In this case, we're in a ventilation program, trying to clear the poisonous fumes from Yai's house, so in the cyber world we have to dodge puffs of cyber gas, or cleverly use them to our advantage to cross gaps in the data paths. It's still a very early level, so it isn't very long or challenging, but it kinda has to be this way in case you haven't played the first Battle Network. This does have the side effect of making Mega Man feel weak and slow if you've recently finished a different Battle Network game, and this is a trend that continues throughout the series. It's not like they can do anything to fix it. It just felt like my controller was broken, but the problem was just that my buster speed was back to zero now. I gotta readjust. Mega Man quickly finds the one responsible for the attempted asphyxiation, and it's... Oh no. After his defeat, we hear Airman's operator talking about his group who's gonna take over, and this sounds awfully familiar to World 3. Boy, I sure hope every game in the franchise doesn't revolve around a different but similar criminal syndicate composed of four to six evil Navi operators with distinct elemental motifs. That would get old. <coughs> in a cut to the subway, we find Ara Arashi? Hold up. Th that's a... Japanese name. They didn't even change it for no fucking reason, like everyone else in this series. Even the names that are in English. There's a reason for that though, I think. Mega Man Battle Network 2, and by extension most of the games, have what I assume to be a rushed English translation. Given the short time between releases, it's not unlikely. It's not always immediately noticeable, but the character's dialogue sometimes just doesn't flow right. Many conversations read as stiff and inhuman, like you ran all their lines through Google Translate without localizing them. Some lines are even clearly attributed to the wrong character. As a result of this, the game isn't as changed or censored as some of the other Battle Network games so most of the new characters still have their Japanese names. And the game still includes some mild curse words like damn and hell, despite being rated E. The cracks in the translation also remove a bit of foreshadowing that should be in this scene. So Arashi is talking to his boss and decides to quit. Unfortunately for him, his boss isn't super keen on an ex-mob member walking around with all their secrets, so he... Holy fuck, that guy's dead. That was 
surprisingly dark. Anyway, the shadowy figure shouts that Gospel is the best Net Mafia organization ever. To no one in particular, because he just blew up the guy he was talking to. Gospel is that foreshadowing I mentioned. If you've played the later classic Mega Man games, you'll remember this purple robot wolf named Treble. He was like the evil version of Rush. Well, in Japan, Treble is named Gospel. This will be important later, so keep it in mind. Back in ACDC town, the gang helps Yai to bed before heading home for the day. Wanting to make the best of his school break, Land decides to set up a camping trip for him and his friends. But they all have more important things to do than go die in the middle of the woods from what would somehow still be an internet-related disaster that would likely ensue. But this is a game, and things have to happen, so Lan conveniently gets an email blast from the Net Battle organization, informing him that the next stage of the license exam is currently taking place in Marine Harbor. Jacking into the testing network, we meet the test administrator. But let's check out the shops first to make sure we're prepared. There are three types of merchants in Battle Network 2. Net dealers, subchip dealers, and bug frag dealers. Net dealers handle battle chips and the returning purchasable upgrades, HP memory, and power-ups. Subchip dealers sell the new subchip items that you can use outside of battle, like health energy, keys for locked data crystals, or the new evade item that works like a repel in Pokemon to cut back on those endless random battles. Bug frag dealers are a special type of merchant that only trade in the new currency, bug fragments, which can be sparsely found around the world. There's like maybe 50 in the whole game. For some reason, these bits of corrupted junk data are really valuable, and you can offer them up in exchange for much rarer chips than you find at the regular stores. Now that we've seen satiated our capitalist system, let's get on with the exam. First up is an endurance battle against five waves of viruses, and it's so easy I don't even remember if I got hit or not. Next, we're given a vague hint to go help a Navi. All the game tells us is that he's lost... somewhere. Yeah, they're still padding the game with stuff like this. It isn't terrible, but it's clearly Capcom stretching out what little data they could fit on a GBA cart into as long a game as possible, which is understandable. We find the Navi, and it turns out he's lost because he's missing his walk program and just can't move. Why is that a removable file? That's kind of fucked up, right? We find the evil Navi who stole it, bring it back, and now it's time for test three. Another gauntlet where I actually had to put in some effort to win. And ta-da, we get the B license, which allows us to be a practicing Navi battler, which means, at last, we can fight against rival net navvies. Wait. We also get a reg up, short for regular memory upgrade. You remember the chip folder from the first game, right? Well, it's been slightly adjusted since then to try and balance things a little better. Now you can only hold five of a single chip at a given time, rather than ten. Chips also now have a memory value to show how much space they take up. You can set a single chip to always appear on the first turn of battle, but only if its size is lesser or equal to your folder's regular memory. This is a good idea for a mechanic, ruined by the fact it'll take us the entire game to get the memory to a decent level. That night, Proto Man and Show check out the NetSquare forums where they find messages threatening a mass attack on Electopia. Author's note, Electopia is the name of the imaginary country that the Mega Man Battle Network series takes place in. This is, however, another pointless dub changes in the original Japanese version, Land just lives in Japan. I'm not a snobby weeaboo elitist or anything like that, I just think it's really strange that they keep changing all these innocuous places for no real reason. The following morning, Land meets up with his friends to go on their camping trip, but when they get there, they find Sho waiting for them. Obviously, Sasuke over here doesn't give a single solitary fuck about camping, so so there's clearly another reason for his being here, but no point in dwelling on that now. Once at the campsite, the group decides to, and by that I mean tells Lan to, set up a cooking area by finding wood and stuff.
Despite his insufferable shonen rival personality, Lance still refuses to leave without making sure Sho is safe. Atop the dam, we find a workman's room that's locked. Sho calls to tell us he's inside, trying to stop a second bomb that would destroy the dam and flood Electopia. He gives Lan and Mega Man the task of finding the four remote detonators around the park and shutting them down. Since it's divided into several chunks, this is the first Battle Network dungeon, and one of the very few, that has no puzzle associated with it. There are paths that will explode when you approach them, but it's not a danger to Mega Man. The various junctions have numbers on them that I have to figure have something to do with what route to take, so time for some well thought out strategic map movement. Or I'll just mindlessly run down every path and hope I find a way through eventually. Yeah, that sounds easier, I'm gonna do that. But fear not. There's still some random bullshit to put up with, even without a puzzle. In these detonators, one of the mobs you can encounter is three handies. Handies drop a bomb with a three second timer that damages Mega Man's entire field if it goes off. You can shoot it to stop the explosion, but this early in the game, the Mega Buster is only just barely strong and fast enough to do so. So, if we were to face, say, three of these guys simultaneously, what do you think would happen? After taking out the third detonator, Sho tells us that the final one is being held by the operator responsible for this. We're able to easily find him as he's a unique NPC, and if a character isn't one of the five copy-paste city folk, they're definitely important. No. The last bomb switch is in his P.E.T. We're just a kid, we've got no way to stop- Ugh, they're all so fucking dumb. This guy's Navi is quickman.exe. A simple boss that can take a while to beat based on your chip folder. If you try to attack Quickman, he'll use his boomerangs to protect himself no matter what. To deal damage, you have to bait him into attacking, then strike back in the small window as his boomerang returns to him. This isn't a big deal once you figure it out, but a lot of battle chips are simply too slow to hit him, or he won't get close enough, in the time given, meaning unless you've gone out of your way to get more specific chips, it's shotguns and navi assists for this one. Speedy Dave? Speedy Dave? Who the fuck wrote this? Why is that the one character whose name you chose to fuck with? After another small time skip, we find Lan and Mega Man deciding what to write about for Lan's summer project, when a balloon with a chip attached to it gets caught in a tree nearby. Mega Man translates the data and finds it's from <sighs> No comment. 
our heroes head to the net to do some research about Name Redacted, and hopefully meet Land's new pen pal. But going to Name Redacted isn't going to be that straightforward. There's a security cube that can only be moved if we have an A-class net battler license, so it's time for more challenges back at the Marine Arbor. In our never-ending quest to complete all of the backtracky busy work in the world, we're turned away from the A-class exam because we haven't been helping enough people, so we're off to do three simple side quests. Nothing worth talking about, but I did come up against something unrelated that I both love and hate about all Battle Network titles that I want to mention now. Once you've defeated a Robot Master, <laughs> Maverick, <laughs> Rival Navi, the remaining data will float around the net. This enables you to re-battle them and get their unique battle chips or other rewards. Well, that sounds neat. How do we trigger them? You don't. They're random encounters. Yep. You can just be walking around and suddenly be ambushed by a powered up version of a boss you just recently fought. If you didn't save, you could be supremely fucked and lose a chunk of progress for no reason other than the game decided it wanted to fuck you today. I like this mechanic, but I just wish you had control over when you rematch the navvies rather than them occurring at no specific time in certain areas. An hour later, we're back for our test. Got a survival battle, no problem. Then we gotta go find some bad navvies out in the net. Nowhere specific, just out there. Oh, here's one. Let's take him out. This is why sorties are probably the worst enemy in the first half of the game. Not only do they have a lot of health in comparison to all the other early enemies, they're the only common enemy that will force you into an unwinnable state just for not baiting them hard enough. If they don't get to swing at you for like five seconds, they'll use area grab. Mess up twice and... I lost a half hour of gameplay because of that shit. With an A license, we can now open the way to Name Redacted. And nobody's here. Navvies around the area will tell you this is supposed to be the most populated region of the internet, and yet there's no natives anywhere to be seen. Aside from one or two tourists and a merchant, this place is deserted. Hiding in the forums, we meet the Navi of the person who sent the balloon. What a coincidence! They warn Lan and Mega Man that Electopia will be next in the Assassin's Path when... Cutman.exe is a boss that you should be able to handle, but might still catch you off guard. He only has three attacks, and they're not a hassle to dodge, but he's got this rotating scissor that can't be destroyed, and if you do get hit, he does a fuckload of damage. It being, you know, Cutman, I wasn't taking him too seriously, and actually almost died. Back at the Psy Lab, which is now in a completely different location, Dr. Hikari and Sho prepare for the countrywide cyber attack. Land wants to help out, but his dad knows Mega Man would get stomped by Shadow Man. However, he's been planning for this eventuality, and asks us to find a file called change.bat that can be used to strengthen Mega Man. In typical Battle Network fashion, he has no idea where to find this rare thing, so we'll go around all the places we visited, complete a series of fetch quests from person to person, and eventually find whatever the fuck it is we're looking for. Surprise, it's right back where we got damn started. After fighting off the Guardian programs, Lamb brings his dad the change file that he then installs into Mega Man. Nothing happens. 
Not yet, anyway. Yuichiro says that the new power is like a seed based on Mega Man's capabilities, so we'll just have to wait and see what he means. Shadow Man begins his attack on Electopia's master computer, and Land rushes in to help the official net battlers stop it. The Master Computer is the next dungeon, and we're back to solving puzzles to progress. This time, the floors are covered with jumbles of letters. A prog somewhere in the area will give you a riddle to solve, and the answer has to be spelled out. I really like this idea for a dungeon. Puzzles based on thinking rather than trial and error or reflexes is a good change of pace. Mega Man now has access to Style Change, the coolest mechanic they added to Battle Network 2. Mega Man will adopt one of five styles based on how the player has been battling throughout the game. And for the record, I didn't remember how to get each style and didn't check a guide, so any styles I get are purely based on my own personal play style and weren't manipulated in any way. Now then, the five styles are... Guts Style earned by killing viruses with the buster above all else. This reduces Mega Man's buster speed to 1, but doubles his power. He also gets super armor, meaning he won't flinch or be knocked back by attacks. Team Style, earned by destroying viruses with Navi chips the most. This style allows Land to load more high-tier chips into his folder, up to 8. Unless you have some sort of special build or strategy in mind, this one doesn't seem to be that useful. Custom Style, Unlocked by using regular battle chips more than any other type. Custom style is like a more useful version of team style, letting Mega Man actually start every battle with seven chips instead of five, rather than a simple folder increase. Shield style, activated by prioritizing defensive and healing chips. In this style, Mega Man will start with a barrier in every fight, in addition to that shield on his arm. By pressing B and backwards at the right time, Mega Man can greatly reduce damage from incoming attacks. Hub Style, or Saito Style in other regions, is the most powerful style change in Battle Network 2. Lan and his brother Hub enter a state of perfect sync, granting them the powers of the other four styles combined. But, if you recall from Battle Network 1, Lan suffers damage as well when this power is used, because his DNA becomes 100% the same as Hub's. As such, Mega Man's HP is cut in half when using Hub Style, presumably because the brother's pain is duplicated between the two of them. This style is incredibly powerful, but not really worth the effort you need to unlock it. In order to get Hub Style, you have to get an S rank on every V3 boss in the game. Meaning, you have to get an S on the special jacked up versions of the bosses that I mentioned earlier, the random rematch fights. Getting an S requires you to beat the boss in under 30 seconds without getting hit, and... <laughs> absolutely not. Whenever you get a new style, it'll be given one of four elements, fire, elec, wood, or aqua, at seemingly random. If there's any way to influence what element you get, nobody's figured it out. This affects your elemental weakness, as well as what type of special charge shot you'll get. You can hold two styles at a time, not counting Mega Man's default style, earning a new one every 280 battles. And that's all you need to know about style change. In one of the gates guarding the Master Computer, we find Proto Man about to face down Shadow Man. Mega Man offers assistance, but Sho insists they go protect the main computer instead, and Lan begrudgingly agrees. Many, many riddles later, we reach the central control program and find... Shadow Man. Hmm.
Shadowman.exe, as you'd expect, is a ninja who teleports around the field using shuriken and his shadow clones to attack. The shadow clones can be destroyed, but they will block your bullets, and he regenerates them constantly. You can tell which one is real by looking at his HP value underneath. When his health gets low, he'll trade his shadow clones for these two invincible holograms that take up Mega Man's side of the field and attack. They don't do a lot of damage, but they move so fast and frequently that it's tough to get a shot in on Shadow Man to finish him off. Once again, back in Lan's room, we find him procrastinating on his homework as usual. But this time, he's saved by an important email from the Net Battler Association. An urgent meeting is being held in the city of Netopia to discuss what should be done about Gospel, and Lan is invited to take part. The subway isn't going to cut it this time too far. So, we're taking a plane to get to Netopia. In a very bizarre and kind of pointless series of events, Lan isn't allowed to take Mega Man onto the plane, increased security because of Gospel, so his PET is taken away. He's then robbed by some random guy with a painfully French accent, and great, all of our money is gone. We talk to Sho near the gate, and he hands us Mega Man back, saying he used his net battler authority to get it. Then we ride the plane and arrive in Natopia, and right away we find the guy who stole all our zenny, we beat him in a net battle, and he gives it all back. That sequence of events took place over about two minutes. If you're trying to build tension or make the player worried about how they're going to proceed, maybe don't give me both Mega Man and my money back 30 seconds after taking them away. See, you should do what this friggin' creepo does and force a little boy into his car, beat him up, and take all his battle chips, then throw him out onto the street. Oh fuck. We have no battle chips now. Mega Man and Lan aren't too happy about it either, getting into an argument and blaming each other till Lan tosses his PET on the hotel floor and leaves. He wanders around town for a bit, and after a conversation with Higsby, who happened to be here looking for rare chips, Lan realizes his mistake and comes back to apologize. When he returns, he finds Mega Man has been damaged while he was gone and his passport was taken. Great, more missing shit. We catch wind that our passport is probably on its way to the Undernet, but the only jack and spot we can find is guarded by a gang leader named Raul. He's willing to let Lan use his radio to get to the net, but only if we can beat his Navi Thunderman. <laughs> So, I got an Aqua style change. It's weak to elect, so I can't really use it in this fight. I also can't change my chip folder because it's, you know, missing. This is bad, because most if not all of my chips I had on are close range melee attacks, and Thunderman has these three impenetrable clouds that will not stop fucking shocking you and blocking your shots. This boss isn't hard, it's poorly thought out. You can't have a boss who deals in exclusively long range attacks if you won't let me change my chips to compensate. So I had to go to this small section of the net that's available and grind projectile based battle chips for a half hour so I could actually fight this glorified lightning rod. But I did it eventually and made it to the Netopia area of the... net. Someone should have thought about that name a little more. Mega Man stops the Thief Navi from selling off Land's passport, but there's still the matter of the battle chips to work out. Talking to one of the kids in the alley, we learn about some posh woman in the market for rare chips, so if someone was selling them, she probably bought them. Hanging out in a jewelry store, because that's not on the nose, we see Miss Millions, not a dub change, lounging around and waiting for some excitement. Ew. If we beat her Navi Snake Man, she'll give us our battle chips back, so let's do that. Snakeman.exe is dumb and easy. Much like Quick Man, you can only hit him when he's attacking, or else he'll duck into his pot. No problem, it just takes a while.
After a long, hard day of getting mugged in what is clearly supposed to be an XB of America, our team of protagonists retire to their hotel room. Early the next morning, Lan gets a message from the NBA that contains a coded phrase to reveal the meeting location. The last sentence has all of its first letters capitalized, and if you take those letters, you get Net Castle. So we go to the only castle around these parts, find a secret wall, and would you look at that, here we are. Looks like Sho is already here, as is Raul, who's actually an official net battler as well. There's two NPCs with generic designs, so they aren't important. But this last one here is Princess Pride, a name that's so anime, I don't even need to tell you that it's her original name as well. I cannot believe how much murder they're getting away with when this game's rated 6+. plus. Okay, we gotta escape this dungeon, by sending Mega Man into the trap control consoles and turning them off so Lan can progress. In the castle's network, there are vampires, which drain your health, ghosts that drag you back to the nearest gravestone, and thieves who steal half of your zenny if they touch you. All three of them only follow a set path, so you can lose them if you try and hide around corners, Unless that corner was their set path anyway. Well, since we're gonna die anyway, time to bust up the big guns. Program Advance. A program advance is a secret technique that can be activated by selecting certain battle chips in a set sequence. The only way to find these, as far as I'm aware, are to do side quests on the forum, or just look them up online. You likely won't find a program advance on accident, as they require three chips with certain codes in an arbitrary order. So even if you did figure out which chips to use, you'd probably get the codes to the order wrong. High level folders are usually built entirely around these, because they snap the entire fucking game in half with most of them easily doing upwards of 300 damage. Lan spots an unconscious and previously on fire role, and before he can deduce what happened, Sho appears and accuses Lan of being a gospel spy sent to take out the net battlers. So he challenges us to a net battle instead of just punching us or something. The fight with Proto Man is basically the same as the first game. Sword attacks, he's got a shield he uses occasionally, nothing we haven't dealt with. Raul regains consciousness after the fight and warns the two that Princess Pride is the real traitor. The only other unique NPC, who would have guessed? With Proto Man deleted until Sho can get his backup data, it's up to Mega Man to save everyone as usual.
Pride's Net Navi Nightman isn't super thrilled about having to fight Mega Man, but being a knight, he's bound by the order of his ruler and attacks. Nightman EXE's main gimmick is that he doesn't move. When his body is grayed out, he only takes one damage from any attack. When his barrier drops, you can actually start putting the hurt on him. His attack patterns are basic. The only thing that's really dangerous is when he jumps forward. He can only do this attack twice, but when he does, it cracks all of the panels in the arena. So when he starts dropping rocks from off screen, you'll most likely get stuck on a single panel, and I hope you're ready to tank 100 plus damage. Once more, the day is saved. Pride is captured, and the net battlers have their wounds treated. It's time for Land to head back to ACDC Town. We get back on the plane, so and so happens, not important stuff. Eventually, Land overhears that there's a poisonous spider aboard the plane. Like, murder poisonous. We should fix that. We meet a member of some kind of bug society who helps us out and gives us a list of components to make a trap. We'll need a stick, a box, string, and whiskey to use as bait. Something about pheromones, I don't know. Maybe this weirdly specific looking NPC can help us. Uh, Mega Man, can you hack into the plane's engine, please? So we built the spider trap. Hooray! Oh, what now? Someone, or something, has infiltrated the plane's engines and is bombarding them with powerful magnetic waves. So Mega Man heads in to fix things, and I promise I didn't remember this part when I made that joke a few seconds ago. Inside the plane, there are large sections of the data paths that are surrounded by magnetic force. These work pretty much the same as the arrow tiles that exist in the rest of the game. The difference being that these can be turned off by finding the actuators in each area, one for red waves and one for blue. These magnets also affect virus battles, with magnetic panels taking up the field. If Mega Man gets in one square of a magnetic panel, it will quickly pull him in, so we need to exercise caution when dodging attacks. You know the routine, we find the enemy navi at the end of the line. Magnet Man and his operator, the powerful CEO, Goss Magnus. CEO of what? Who knows? The game doesn't say what his company is or what it makes. Presumably electronic parts of some kind. He's hijacking the plane to find one of those super program thingamajigs Gospel needs to create their super navi. Why are these super powerful programs just lying around in places like ovens and planes and shit? Magnet Man EXE is a real strain on your left thumb. Not only can he spawn more magnet panels around the field, his attacks also all home in on Mega Man, so you're gonna be dancing around a lot to avoid him. He's also got this one attack where he creates an opposite version of himself and... All the plane systems are returned to normal. Mr. Magnus is arrested, and our heroes return home to await yet another inevitable Monster of the Week situation. Yep, that'll do it. Mail calls Lan in a panic as the earthquake knocked out her connection to Roll while she was on the net. Since she wasn't jacked out properly, Roll and Mail have lost all contact, but Mail remembers that she was in Name Redacted before the connection broke. Oh hey, look at that! It's the worst, laziest part of the game! <sighs> Alright, let's go over this. The next chapter of the game revolves around this virus ice that's appeared all over the net. This ice has halted the various programs that control the environment in Electopia, leading to large-scale natural disasters forming around the country. Lan heads to his dad for help, and using a piece of the ice that Mega Man grabbed, he's able to create a cure for the virus, but only for one of the colors. If we want to break all the ice, 
we'll need samples of the other colors as well. This is done by randomly backtracking and retreading all of the net areas we've been to so far. Literal dozens of times. At least 10 full back and forths across the entire netscape and I'm lowballing that number. That's it. That's the whole chapter. Over two hours of visiting places we've already been, fighting viruses we've already fought, but now we have to hope we have the right cure to go down the right paths or risk wasting large chunks of time doing stupid back and forths with a bunch of brain dead dickheads who make us relay messages or grab files for them despite the fact they're on the fucking internet. <laughs> no sugarcoating, this part of the game fucking sucks. And I cannot imagine how this got past playtesting. This entire chapter makes me wonder why I used to think this was my favorite Battle Network game. And honestly, I think it's because I must have blocked this from my memory. It's that bad. At one point, I caught myself slumped over in my chair with my mouth hanging open, the controller absentmindedly slipping out of my hands before I dropped it and suddenly snapped back into consciousness. I really don't get why this game feels like it needs to do so much busy work and stall tactics just to make the game longer. I'd wager a good 30% of the game, at least, is just walking to places you've already been. A fast travel system would have greatly improved this game's flow and cut down about 4 or 5 hours of the game's overall length. Which is fine, because that still leaves over 15 hours of content. What's worse is that throughout the game, you see a ton of broken teleporters and code boxes that should be fast travel points, but you can't activate them till the end of the game anyway, so what's the point? The regular gameplay, the battles, and most of the dungeons are great, but the hour or two of bullshit in between each main section is exhausting. I didn't even touch the tons of side quests and extra bosses you can do because, well, that sounds like a lot more walking to places I've already been. It's not like this is exclusively Capcom's fault for this, though. Most RPGs were just like this back in the 90s and early 2000s. It's why a lot of early RPGs aged poorly. We hadn't yet reached the collective point where we decided that slowly walking blindly around giant maps being an errand boy isn't enjoyable structure for a video game. It's completely unnecessary for you to purposefully put not fun content in your game just to stretch the playtime out. But that's where 20 or so years of hindsight gets you. After much boredom, we learn that there's a secret area in Kotobuki Square where Freeze Man, the navvy that's been making all this ice, is hiding out. Freezeman.exe is a guy that shoots ice. It's slippery. A week later, Lang gets a net battler notification to check out Kotobuki Square once again, as the gospel attacks aren't stopping. When they arrive first, because of course Land and Mega Man arrive first, they find a large transfer portal where an endless stream of gospel navvies and viruses are pouring in. The pair head to the lab to talk to Dr. Hikari and seek his assistance as usual. Kotobuki, the real town of Kotobuki, has been emitting insane levels of electromagnetic radiation. Lethal levels, in fact. Someone needs to take the radiation suit and go stop whatever Gospel is doing. But Sho has been missing for three days, and all the other net battlers are occupied or out of commission.
I'm just gonna say it. This place looks fucking, fucking sick. sick. A fitting location for our final battle. When Lan tries to enter the tower, he finds the elevator is stuck. How and why? Somehow, Mail, Dex, and Yai managed to get to the tower before Lan in an attempt to help him clear out the radiation. Aw, oh, that's sweet, guys. How far did you... <sighs> to progress in the tower, we need to lower the EMR levels from these servers that are literally growing out of the ground from the floors. When we jack in, we discover this is being caused by the two worlds merging together. There's so much electric energy flying around that reality and the net are colliding and becoming one in a violent fashion. The paths around the netscape are distorted and mangled, causing Mega Man to warp to unrelated random areas until he can fix the radiation dampeners around the place, find the parts, fix the teleporter, then use it to progress. In usual Mega Man tradition, you'll encounter boss rushes along the way to the finale. The first one featuring Air Man, Quick Man, and Cut Man, and the second featuring Night Man, Magnet Man, and Freeze Man. All the while, Lan tries to stay conscious and fight off the increasing radiation engulfing the building.
Ooh, he, he did it. He, he said the thing. I get it. I get the joke. This is Gospel Super Navi, the Battle Network iteration of Dr. Wily's ultimate weapon, Base. Base.exe was a secret boss in the first Battle Network, being the strongest enemy in the game. A Navi who has a perfect copy ability, much like classic Mega Man. But this version doesn't seem right. He's incredibly easy, arguably the easiest boss in the game. He only has two basic buster attacks, doesn't guard himself, and just sorta teleports around randomly? That's really odd. Base shouldn't be this weak.
the multi-bug organism, Gospel, is the true final boss of Battle Network 2. A giant wolf that resembles Treble, Base's companion in the original Mega Man, Gospel is certainly a step up from the joke that was the life virus. Gospel can only be hurt when his mouth is open for attack, while large chunks of debris continually fly across the field. He mostly fires energy waves from his mouth, but is also able to turn its head into a huge drill, breathe fire, create wind, and make copies of previous bosses. To top it all off, he has 2000 HP, and without program advances, your attacks on average hover around 100 damage. I probably should have loaded my deck up with some quick powerful advances to beat Gospel super fast, but I think it's more fun this way rather than just tossing out some crazy combo that does 500 HP. With Gospel, the creature and the organization, deleted, Lan finds the boy, his name is Sean by the way, unconscious on the floor. Mega Man spots a journal nearby and begins reading it, as it details Sean's motivation. His parents died in a plane crash when he was five, and he was left with unspecified abusive relatives as a result. His upbringing instilled in him a hatred for humanity, and using his deceased parents' fortune, he formed the Net Mafia Gospel to remake the world into a kinder place. When Sean wakes up, Lan assures him that he'll be punished for his crimes, but also promises to give him a chance at redemption once he's ready. Another day, another incompetent international terror organization foiled by an 11-year-old and his smartphone. All's well that ends well, I suppose. So, Mega Man Battle Network 2. I... didn't like it as much as I remembered I did. Don't get me wrong, it's still really good, and much better than the first, with things like program advance, style change, and the expanded Netscape, but the amount of filler introduced to fill that new Netscape borders on comical at times. I started laughing two hours into that ice quest, because I just could not believe they had me go back and forth between Netopia 2 and Undernet 3 like four times in a row. It's, it's absurd. If I had one other nitpick, it's that they probably could have introduced Sean earlier and developed him and his background a little more than just a mean voice on a black screen. Maybe drop some more hints about his backstory or something, because as it is, his entire motivation is a literal afterthought once the game is already finished. Overall, Mega Man Battle Network 2 is a superior game to its prequel that adds and improves upon it in almost every way. It could have been one of my favorites still, if not for the stupid amount of unnecessary padding to fill time. I just personally don't have much patience for that kind of stuff. Still though, very much recommended, and probably the best place to start if you want to play the Battle Network games. Oh god, two Battle Networks down, four to go.
Anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you did, please remember to leave a like or subscribe if you are new. I also have a Twitter account that I decided I want to actually start updating, so once we get a few followers over there, like, I don't know, around 20, something like that, I'll start doing that, so check it out if you're interested in updates and polls and stuff. That is all for today, friends. Remember to stay safe, observe social distancing guidelines, and have a wonderful day. Bye, guys.